Good morning, uh, Kwan Sa. I'm Associate Medical Director of Trauma at Riverside Methodist Hospital, and uh, I'm going to give you a talk on pelvic trauma today. For those of you who are uh, statistics nuts, um, it's a little bit about pelvic trauma. It accounts for 3% of all skeletal trauma out there. 55% um, of all pelvic fractures are stable. Uh, however, uh, up to 25% uh, will have some sort of rotational instability, and that means around the pelvis, uh, there'll be an unstable portion. And then 20% uh, will have rotational and vertical instability, where the pelvis is uh, unstable around the pelvis as well as up and down the pelvis. Um, there's a 16% association with acetabular fractures, and um, a small percentage, thankfully, are open pelvic fractures, 2 to 4%. The great majority of pelvic fractures occur in the, in the female population. Um, and uh, I'll go back to that as, as to why that is. Uh, the majority of, however, the majority of high energy uh, pelvic fractures are in males. Uh, and that, of course, you know, occurs because males are uh, more likely to uh, uh, participate in um, high energy activities uh, that can obviously cause trauma. Uh, low energy is typically for females. And as you can imagine, as our population is aging, um, uh, you, you get a lot of ground level falls in the elderly. Uh, females outlive the males, so there's a preponderance for uh, the females to have pelvic fractures as we age, uh, but those are low energy fractures. Um, Genitourinary trauma, more common in males than females, and as you can imagine, that's related to the anatomy. Um, the uh, males have uh, um, the um, prostatic urethra going through the urogenital diaphragm there. Um, so more likely to get injured in a pelvic fracture than a female. Female's urethra is quite short. Um, median age for uh, pelvic fractures is 65. Um, some more epidemiology, the incidence in polytrauma, those that are multiply injured, uh, 25, 30%. And pelvic fractures are a common cause of mortality. Uh, anywhere from 16 to 20%. If you have a pelvic fracture with shock, uh, presumably from hemorrhagic shock, they have a high mortality rate, and you're looking at about 30 to 40% of those people not surviving. Uh, and then, of course, the most common cause of death in those people is they bleed out, 60 to 65%. Late death is typically with sepsis and multi-organ system failure. A little bit about the anatomy of the pelvis. Um, three primary bones make up the pelvis anteriorly. You have the ilium, and the ischium, and, the, and then the uh, pubis bone here. Posteriorly, you got the sacrum and the coccyx. So those are the major bones of the pelvis. And these bones are held together by some very strong ligaments. I won't even go through all these, but basically uh, understand, sorry, that the pelvis uh, is uh, held together uh, by these very strong ligaments that basically have to disrupt in order for the pelvis to fracture, uh, unless of course it is uh, in, in the uh, bone itself. The vascular anatomy to the pelvis is quite rich. Uh, there are major blood vessels that uh, course down the posterior aspect of the pelvis. And then, of course, uh, they um, exit here. So you've got your external internal iliacs. The internal iliacs uh, give off a rich blood supply. Um, and then venous, obviously the veins here, uh, probably the, is the most common source of significant bleeding in, in pelvic fractures. Not arterial, it's, it's venous. Uh, a couple of different classifications for pelvic fractures. Not that it's important for you guys to understand this, but um, there uh, are two ways to describe pelvic fractures in, in, in the, for uh, a trauma surgeon and orthopedic surgeons. Um, there's a tile classification and the Young-Burgess classification. Basically, 
the tile classification is based upon the manner in which the pelvis is unstable. And then the young Burgess classification is classification I, I learned and grew up with. Uh, basically, it's the mechanism of injury that, um, uh, that classifies the pelvic fracture. So there's a lateral compression pelvic fracture where the pelvis uh, is hit from the side. Uh, and there's obviously subsets of those. There's the anterior posterior compression fracture or the so-called open book pelvic fracture where the um, pubic symphysis is sprung. So that ligament is disrupted. Uh, and of course there's subsets of those. And as you get a higher type, uh, obviously you have a more severe injury. And then you have the uh, vertical shear pelvic fracture where basically the hemi pelvis is uh, come unhinged and you've got the posterior uh, uh, the sacroiliac joint disrupted as well as the, the front of the um, pelvis. So a little bit more closer look at these kind of pelvic fractures here and how they occur in lateral compression hit by the side. More common uh, to have genitourinary trauma in those kind of patients. Uh, lateral compression fracture, I'm sorry, the uh, um, anterior posterior compression fracture. Uh, or the open book, and then the vertical shear. So here's some x-ray examples. So this is a uh, example of a uh, lateral compression fracture uh, where someone's fallen on their hip and they've disrupted their superior and inferior pelvic rami. This is uh, obviously an open book pelvic fracture or an anterior, an anterior posterior compression fracture. And you can see here, the uh, pubic symphysis is spread and disrupted. Um, the sacroiliac joints should look like this, a, a, a very small line here. But then on the left side here, obviously there's disruption of this sacroiliac joint. And you can imagine the blood vessels back, you can imagine the blood vessels that course back through this pelvis here, uh, getting stretched and uh, lacerated. Uh, because of this um, um, sacroiliac disruption. This is uh, probably a combination uh, lateral compression fracture, vertical shear. Uh, you can see the, the right the right hemi, hemi pelvis is disrupted. And then, of course, here, the pubic symphysis is, uh, is uh, completely disrupted here. Uh, probably took a lot of force on this right leg uh, on an upward kind of force and, and, and uh, on the side to disrupt this pelvic ring. So for first responders out there, uh, you get a bad pelvic fracture. Uh, what's the first thing uh, that we try to have you do? Well, we, a pelvic binder is probably um, the best thing to kind of stabilize the pelvis. And by doing so, uh, potentially uh, reducing the amount of hemorrhage that occurs uh, with these uh, pelvic fractures. Um, uh, in fact, they're better than an external fixator at controlling uh, uh, hemorrhage, uh, reduces the pelvic volume, and that's how you reduce the amount of ble bleeding. And uh, you don't want to keep these on, however, for a prolonged period of time because um, the longer you do, the more likely you are to get some pressure ulcers around the hips. Um, so uh, obviously it's a temporizing measure, but a very important one. This is kind of classically how you're taught or we're taught to put a pelvic, uh, uh, a, a, a pelvic binder on. If you got a sheet, uh, you wrap it around, uh, you, you, you twist it in the front and then um, basically uh, hold it together with uh, hemostats. Uh, the placement is quite important. They've got this, this thing has to go right around the hips, uh, too high and, and too low, not, not effective in actually reducing the pelvic volume. There's a number of commercial entities out there that uh, help with this. Um, so you don't have to use a sheet. There's the SAM. Uh, the teapot is what we have at Riverside. Um, basically, uh, um, it, it's a very quick and easy way of placing this pelvic binder. 
Um, and I'll kind of go through, a, uh, I'll actually uh, show you a video on how this is actually uh, um, placed. So then I said, her suitism sounds more like his suitism. I'll uh, <laughs> advance through the uh, comedy here. I'm Julia Paris. Be with our tech for patients with unstable pelvic fractures to have rice bleeding. To compress an open pelvic fracture, the binder needs to cover the anterior superior iliac spine as well as the greater trochanter of the femur on both sides. So when he says open pelvic fracture, that's not what he really means. He means an open book pelvic fracture. Uh, open pelvic fracture uh, implies that there's a wound uh, directly leading to the pelvis. So. Go over some anatomy. Identify the external anatomy of the anterior superior iliac spine and the greater trochanter of the femur on both sides. Your binder needs to cover both of these to compress the pelvis. Unfurl the binder and remove the Velcro bracket. So obviously this is a T-pod Roll one half of the binder and then log roll your patients. Place the binder underneath the patient with the rolled side as far to the opposite side of the stretcher as possible. Then unfurl the far side, bring both ends to the front of the pelvis. You can either cut the binder or fold it back leaving a six to eight inch gap in the front. Apply the Velcro bracket, and then use the pull tab to tighten the pulleys. Secure the excess string on the front of the bracket and then Velcro down the full tab. Alan, what if you're in a hospital that doesn't have a pelvic binder? What would you do? Well, in a pinch, you can actually use a bed sheet and some hemostats to bind the pelvis in a similar way. Wow, that's so cool. Do you mind just showing me how you do that? Sure, Julia. Thanks, Alan. Fold the hospital sheet lengthwise into a single strap. It's about a foot and a half Cross. Take one end, roll it. Then log roll your patient up. Place the sheet under the pelvis, with the rolled end far to the other side of the stretcher. Unroll the rolled end. Bring both to the front of the patient. Cross the two ends and turn them 180 degrees while holding tension. Then secure the loose ends to the rest of the sheet using hemostats. And there you have it. Now you know how to. So, how we manage pelvic trauma in the emergency department is based upon whether or not the patient is has an unstable pelvis. So, uh, if the if the pelvis is unstable uh, and the patient is unstable. Uh, then we're going to have to do obviously some some interventions, and uh, those include 
a fast exam or a focused abdominal sonogram for trauma, which, which is basically ultrasound, uh, and add to that um, potentially a deep peritoneal lavage or a deep peritoneal aspiration where we're looking for blood in the abdomen. So, sorry, if they're, if they're stable and the fast is negative, then you go to CAT scan. So if they're uh, unstable, uh, you're doing the fast exam, and then if you not if you're not sure if there's blood or not, you do this thing called a deep peritoneal aspiration. Um, and so, uh, if the fast is is negative, meaning there's no blood in the abdomen, then you got to make a decision to go to an angiogram or potentially the operating room. And in the operating room for an unstable pelvic fracture with significant hemorrhage. What we're talking about doing is preperitoneal packing, maybe even a laparotomy, and then trying to put an external fixator. So the emergency room resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the, of the aortic catheter. So th this has become a very important adjunct uh, to um, help temporize bleeding from the pelvis. And what this is is a, a catheter with a balloon on the end. It's a pretty simple device. And basically what this uh, balloon does is we inflate it and it occludes the aorta uh, and stops blood flow to the area that uh, we're concerned about for bleeding. And basically this catheter is placed in a femoral artery and it's placed in, th in two different zones. So I'll go over that here. So the zones, the zones for Reboa, zone one, which is in the thoracic aorta. Uh, so this is where you place the balloon if you have bleeding below the diaphragm. So in the abdomen or abdomen slash pelvis. Zone two is where all the important blood vessels come out uh, in the abdomen. And uh, basically this is a no-go zone. You don't wanna place the balloon here for obvious reasons. And then zone three, if you've got an isolated pelvic fracture, and this is what we're talking about, pelvic trauma here, zone three is typically where you wanna place the, the reboa, and that's below the renal arteries and above the bifurcation of the iliac vessels, basically stopping arterial bleeding uh, in the pelvis. Preperitoneal packing is a, a technique used now uh, to stop uh, bleeding in the pelvis uh, operatively. And what that involves is make, making a small incision right above the pubis um, in the lower abdomen. And here's the umbilicus here. Uh, and there is a potential space called the preperitoneal space. So this is a space that you have to make. Uh, it, it's, it's there, if you dissect it out, it's not in the abdomen. There's a layer of tissue uh, right before you get into the intestines. And that is the space that we develop and then place packs around the pelvis here to help reduce bleeding, basically tampon on any bleeding. Um, and most of the time, as we said, as I said before, this is going to be venous. Upwards of 75% of pelvic bleeding comes from the venous system. Uh, and it can also occlude, it can also tampon on the arterial bleeding as well. So Here's a video of uh, preperitoneal packing because sometimes it's uh, uh, actually a, a, a kind of a weird concept to think about here. And uh, I'll show you a video of somebody actively getting preperitoneal packing for um, acute hemorrhage. The preperitoneal pelvic packing technique was modified in Denver based on the seminal work of the Professor Turney in Hanover and further refined by the work of uh, Professor Trentz in Zurich. Access to the pelvis is through a lower midline abdominal incision. It's important to maintain focus on the midline because the fascia becomes attenuated below the semi line. 
once the skin is opened, and this is approximately a six centimeter incision. Then, of course, the subcutaneous tissue is divided down to the level of the fascia. Of course, uh, under uh, urgent conditions of advanced shock, the technique is uh, done much quicker uh, with a knife and without concern of uh, superficial bleed. But you can see here, as these tissues are divided, uh, that the underlying fascia becomes uh, clearly visible and the midline can be identified uh, determining the soft tissue on either side. You can see here how the midline is apparent and the underlying blood clarifies the focus of the dissection. Again, it's important to attempt to maintain midline position. In addition to uh, the central position, uh, it's important to mobilize each of the fascial layers uh, to uh, separate carefully from the bladder. And most of the time, the dissection is relatively easy because the blood clot has opened up the proper space. Once in the uh, space of Bretzi, then uh, uh, again, the important point is to locate the bladder and mobilize it to uh, one side for placement of the packs. Okay. The right space is open, then it's important to clear the bladder from uh, both sides. The safest way is to take the finger and sweep along the pelvic rim, beginning on uh, one side across the symphysis and then to the opposite side. In general, we place packs on the side with the most significant bleeding or fracture. In cases where the fractures are similar, such as in this patient, the packs can be placed uh, sequentially. Let me see the first pack. We see an empty sponge stick now. First key maneuver is to drive the pack deep in the pelvis. And that can be done with a sponge stick as shown here, or some uh, can do it with a, a Cobb elevator. But the key point is to get that deepest lap in the uh, pelvis. What I mean by that is positioning that lap in the SI joint and deep in the sacrum where the venous bleeding is most Common. Get the third lap ready, please. Now uh, packed both the right and left side in the deep region. We now approach the middle pack. We'll go back to the right side here. And again, using uh, one type of instrument or the other, it's important to tightly pack the second layer against the deep layer. The uh, final layer, the third layer, is uh, placed above uh, this second pack. And once again, it's important to tightly pack this area. We always place three packs on either side in adults uh, as per protocol. And in children, in fact, uh, we often will only use uh, two packs, depending, of course, on the uh, size of the pelvis. We have a strict protocol of uh, three packs on either side for adults so that the uh, team removing the packs the next day will know uh, how many packs to anticipate as they remove them uh, sequentially. So in sum, that would mean a total of six in adults and uh, four in uh, children. Sticks to me. Well, it's important to emphasize that this is a multidisciplinary 
procedure. Virtually all the time, there is both a trauma team and an orthopedic trauma team uh, doing this procedure simultaneously. That is, the orthopedic team focuses on placing the external fixator while the uh, trauma team uh, primarily directs their attention to the uh, packing of the pelvis. But together, we help each other align the pelvis and determine if the packing has been done as optimally as uh, possible. On occasion, uh, we will, in fact, uh, remove packs from one side uh, or the other and repack if it appears that we've not uh, maximized the opportunity for tamping off. Again, I'd emphasize that uh, generally the cautery is not used in cases of uh, extreme hemorrhage. The next uh, component is to identify the fascial edges so that a tight closure can be made of that midline fascia again. The uh, fascial closure is somewhat complicated uh, in the lower midline. It's important to identify particularly that anterior fascia and get large bites so we can apply tension to the uh, suture line to optimize the tamponade of the preperineal pelvic space. Yeah. To this preperineal pelvic backing yeah. protocol at Denver Health in 2004, and we now have over 150 patients in which it has been applied. Our mortality has literally decreased 50% over the preceding uh, 10 years. Of course, another distinct advantage in preperineal pelvic packing is the ability to manage other life and limb threatening injuries concurrently. Whether this is trauma surgery or orthopedic trauma surgery, it allows both teams to approach these other injuries simultaneously important to recognize that despite very effective packing initially, that roughly 10% of these patients uh, require delayed angioembolization. In conclusion, preperineal pelvic packing is a rapid, life-saving procedure that is applicable to any trauma center with an orthopedic surgeon or general surgeon familiar with pelvic anatomy. Thank you for your attention. So that's a nice uh, video on uh, how the preperitoneal packing is done and the rationale you can hear uh, from the speaker there. Um, and then he's talking also that the uh, orthopedic surgeons are involved as well and uh, stabilizing the pelvis. And here's a couple examples of an external fixator uh, placed on the pelvis uh, to allow for stabilization of the pelvis here. Angiography, he mentioned. Uh, angiography is an important adjunct as well, and you're looking for arterial bleeding in this case. Uh, so um, the algorithm is if you have uh, uh, somebody on standby and, and you want to go to angio first uh, versus surgery, or, or you can do it the other way if uh, you've got a quick availability to get in the operating room and, and do the uh, prepared nail packing and the external fixator, and then see what happens to the patient. And as he was saying, up to 20, 25% of the time, uh, they'll still end up in the angio suite because there'll still be ongoing bleeding from the arterial system. Uh, this here describes, or this here picture uh, is uh, of the um, uh, iliac arteries here. You got the internal and the external iliac arteries and the arrow, the telltale arrows are pointing toward uh, contrast that's extravasating out of small arterioles uh, that end up getting coiled uh, or, or gel foam that gets stuck down there and, and to stop the bleeding. Moving on to a couple of other uh, uh, injuries that occur with the pelvis, um, anterior dislocation and posterior dislocation. 
Uh, probably uh, the posterior dislocation is the more commonly uh, um, encountered injury. Uh, and uh, what that, uh, how that occurs is a direct force on the, uh, on the end of the femur. Uh, it drives the, um, um, the, uh, the acetabulum uh, um, and the, uh, the head of the femur uh, apart. Uh, and so it, it, it causes your uh, posterior uh, hip dislocation to occur. And what this looks like um, uh, clinically here is the leg will be internally rotated. So your knee is pointed at the other knee and foreshortened. So it'll, the leg will be shorter and it'll be internally rotated. And here's the problem here is that the femoral head is out of the uh, acetabulum. And so if any of you have had the opportunity to try to reduce this, uh, you can do this in the field. Uh, obviously, a lot of times it's uh, easier to do it on a patient that has been uh, um, uh, sedated. Uh, but uh, if in a pinch uh, you don't have that ability and you're out in the field, um, it's critical that this uh, uh, dislocation gets reduced uh, um, in, a, in a relatively urgent manner because the blood supply to the femur, the femoral head here, is, is uh, tenuous and it can be disrupted just because it's out of the socket. And so if you disrupt the blood supply to the femoral head, you're going to get something called avascular necrosis. And so the, and that's where the, 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 the femoral head dies off and that person's going to end up needing a hip replace. So if it's not done in an expedient fashion, uh, that's what the potential downside could be. Um, if not done. So how you do that is you, it's a two person uh, job. You got uh, one person pressing down right on the hip area and the other person is going to place their, the crux of their elbow underneath the knee and they'll lift directly up. And so it, it's, it's a lot easier to use your legs. You know, you're going to break your back trying to just lift it with your back, but Lift with your legs and, and apply all, the, all of your weight uh, on that lift to pull this joint back into socket. An anterior hip dislocation, not as common, uh, but, but can occur in injuries where the leg is pulled out and basically gets pushed backwards, resulting in the femoral head to get dislocated anteriorly. And so this looks markedly different from a um, posterior hip dislocation in that the knee is, is ro rotated externally, the hip might be minimally flexed and it's foreshortened. So the posterior dip dislocation, the knee is pointing at the other knee and the leg is foreshortened. An anterior hip dislocation is going in the opposite direction. 